Hello everybody, my name is Sam Lewis and I have the privilege of doing a Q&A today with these wonderful people who are going to introduce themselves in a second and what their job is. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed the production today and we're asking for you to help us find out some answers to some questions that you want to ask as well as some questions I've already prepared if that's okay with you. So thank you very much for being here, sit tight and let's see if this can help us pass whatever we are trying to do with our English qualifications and our drama qualifications and more importantly just learning a little bit more about theatre and how it works. So I'm hoping you've had a fab morning out of school already and let's listen in if that's okay. Any questions we are going to ask you to speak up by sticking your hand up and we will find you with a mic when it gets to that stage. Okie dokie. So without further ado I'll just pass the mics around between us and find out who does what in amongst all of this if that's okay. So here we go. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Helen Logan and um, I'm an actor, but on this production I was actually Ken's assistant director and I've never done that before, so I'm the assistant director. There we are. Hello everybody, my name is Hilary Brooks, I'm a composer, a musical director, sometimes sound designer, come back to that, and, uh, and I've been doing it a long time and I love working with all these people. Hi everybody, thanks very much for coming. It's uh, great to have seen so many of you here this morning. The school's support on this project has been brilliant. Uh, so I'm Ken Alexander and I directed Tally's Blood. Hi everyone, I'm Wayne Dowdswell and I designed the lighting for this production. Hello everybody, I'm Craig McLean and I was playing Huey Devlin. Hi, my name is Fraser Lappin and I was the set and costume designer. We want that back, don't we? <laughs> back I'm not sure. Should we pass this one between us? Thank you so much. Does that work? Okay, so we're going to ask lots of different questions and they can all chip in with answers and uh, help each other, but we're going to just get to know them a little bit and about what the kind of jobs they've been doing and how they've ended up with the production that they have on their hands, okay? So, first of all, um, Ken, over to you directing-wise. Can you tell us about when you first thought about doing this production, if you had an initial idea about what your intentions were for that, and if that's changed to what we've ended up with today? That's a good question. Um, I first came across the play in its very first production at the Traverse Theatre in about 1990 or 91. Um, and at the time, uh, I just came out having loved it. What a great story, great characters. I'd laughed, I'd been moved by it. And I kind of stored it away in the back of my mind as something that one day I'd maybe like to direct. Uh, so come 2003, I had the opportunity to do the play at the New Bayer Theatre in St. Andrews and then on tour. Um, and ever since doing that production again, um, that production at that time, uh, Anne-Marie and I have been trying to get the play off the ground uh, once more for a new production. This is very different from the production we did 20 years ago. There's different emphasis and different design and everybody in it is different. So, um, so coming back to it, I kind of had a really good knowledge of the play, um, but I was keen that everybody who was involved in the new production, all six actors, the creative team, would be able to bring something of themselves to it and, and obviously their expertise to the play. Um, for me, theatre is a really collaborative process. It's not just about what I think the play should be, it's about how everybody contributes to the, the end result. So the things I knew I wanted to do was to be able to tell the story clearly, tell it well, um, and make audiences laugh and hopefully move them with the story as well. Um, I, I was amazed when I first saw it. I knew nothing about the social history of the Scots Italians and, and what that community went through during the war, especially the Second World War. So all of these things that I wanted to bring out, and obviously there's some references in the play which were present in 2023 references of kind of bigotry and hatred and uh, and all these sorts of things and prejudice um, and they they were present in 2003 but because of what's been happening in the UK with the, de the debate over immigration and so forth in the last um, few years since Brexit um, suddenly these issues are really very present again now they're part of the story they're not all of the story um, and for me the biggest thing I love about Anne-Marie's writing is she has such a big heart as a writer. She makes you care for her characters um, and she makes them really enjoyable to watch as well. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Anything you'd like to add about that? Since it's your first time exploring anything that you were hoping that we could do with this production, do you think it's relevant for a modern audience? We've just touched on that. Yeah, I think it's incredibly relevant. Um, possibly even more relevant now than when you first did it, Ken, with everything that's going on in the world at the moment. And um, we see what various um, migrant groups from other countries are being put through here and all over the world. And um, that it, it's it's no different from what happened way back in the 1930s. And we think that the world has moved on so much and yet you see a play like this and you realize, no, all of those issues are still there. People are still being treated the same. And so to put something like that on stage and take it to as many different communities as we can, um, it just puts a mirror up for people to let them see People are still being treated like this. We still need to do something about it. So yeah, I think it's incredibly relevant. It's been very interesting for me to be on this side of things and, and sit alongside Ken, because um, having never done that before, I'm used to thinking about an actor's journey through a play and um, it's very different because you're really only thinking about you and the other characters and how you relate to them on the stage. You're not thinking about the bigger picture and the overall concept of a piece as much when you're an actor. You're aware of it, but, but you're never really part of that process. So it's been very eye-opening for me to be part of that and um, uh, a huge learning curve, all these different disciplines from sound and music and lighting and design. Um, the director has to be all over all of it and kind of the linchpin between all these different uh, disciplines and departments. We go. Thank you so much. Um, so talking about the design, we know the play spans over a long period of time. So can we talk about the set, if that's all right? Did the set present you any challenges? And when you first initially had your creative idea, has that developed into what this is? Or did you know straight away? Oh. Right, answer the first one first. Yeah. The biggest challenge with the play, and I'm going to just look at the set while I talk about this, is the fact that it spans so many years in so many different locations. When I first, I didn't do Tally's Blood at school. I'd never heard of the play, if I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I read it and first thought we could do the whole play just at a table. You could effectively do it as a black box piece with just the table and just the characters interacting with this table. Um, but then as I read it again and then read it a third time, I thought it's more about this family and how they're reacting and interacting with this world which is why the circle was the first thing that appeared, to be honest. And I wanted them to feel both isolated and enclosed in this world and the tall tenements surrounding them, almost enclosing them and making them feel a bit claustrophobic and a bit, can they get out? Do they want to get out? But also a safe space for them to coexist in because there are times in the play where they are a really good family unit that work really well, but then there's other times where actually, they don't want to be here. What was the other part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> so that's brilliant. So that was your initial idea to what we've yes. ended up with now. Mm -hmm. And um, any challenges the set presented you with, since you're going from different locations, are you thinking, actually, I would have loved to have done that, but oh, hang on a second. <laughs> yeah, I get, because we have, so we have the front shop, back shop, which is where most of the action takes place. We have the ginger store, which we decided to stage downstage here on the flat and then we go to Italy and we go to about two different locations in Italy as well as Huey and Bridget's house as well that was the challenge was how do we show all of these locations without doing too many scene changes there's nothing worse than seeing people truck on and off with bits of set every two minutes it's just really dull to look at and because we're touring the show as well practicality wise we aren't touring fly people, we're not touring as many stage managers as we'd probably need to do big scene changes. So which is why the set became quite a static thing with the change of the windows and the shutters for when we go to Italy, we bleed through to the trees at the back. Yeah. 
Excellent. Back. Thank you very much. Um, can we talk about, actually you talked about Scotland versus Italy there, so if we could talk about um, the creation of sound, if that's all right. So the magic mic comes along here. <laughs> can you um, tell us, first of all, if the pieces of sound are original? Some. <laughs> yes, I'm a composer, so uh, hopefully you won't have noticed those bits because the job of underscoring is to support the narrative, support the actors and support the story. Um, so you shouldn't really notice a lot of underscore. It should help a production to be kind of smooth, so ins and outs of scene changes. Maybe you notice some of that little string quartet type thing. And uh, there's obviously... The one thing that Scotland and Italy share is the love of accordion, so it kind of is a bit of that. And uh, so, I yes, I wrote some um, original compositions for that, including the, the mob scene. You knew I was going to mention that. Okay? <laughs> uh, the mob scene, which is a kind of driving, when there's very little dialogue, you can like, crank it up, Adam. So I'm just going to <laughs> shout out Adam Tucker at the back, who's operating sound just now but he is associate sound designer and he's a chap that made it sound really really good in this auditorium because we have lots of different speakers and uh, the concept and preparation of writing tracks for um, on a DAW or whatever um, preparing the tracks uh, for the production is one thing, but then the final delivery of where you want it to feel. For example, the last little bit of country folky band, supposedly, that we always talk about, the wee fat tuba player. I don't know why he's wee and fat, but he is. In that last bit, and it starts here. It's all very jolly when the bands start, but it goes on for like five minutes. So they're over the field. So Adam then puts it over the field to the back speakers. It's all very clever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so um, sound effects themselves, like doors opening and bangings and fireworks and everything, is generally in the, the sound department, which is Adam's department. Um, if there's any live music to deal with, for example, Massimo, it says it in the script that Massimo plays a little bit of Santa Lucia on accordion. So our wonderful actor, Andy Clark, learned to play a little bit of accordion just for this production. He's very musical anyway, uh, but it helped that he's like, I'll give it a go. <laughs> just want to point out that is my 1934 Italian Morelli accordion that he's playing, which is beautiful. Doesn't sound very good, but it's good, lovely. Uh, is that it? Yeah, absolutely. Hey. Thank you very much. Um, so with regards to lighting then, with oh, Italy and Scotland, you were having to use the same set. We've got an idea now what the set's all about with the concept. Was there a lighting concept right from the start? Gosh, I'm not sure if I actually had a concept, but the first thing I became aware of when reading the play is that it's... it's it's huge. It spans about 20 years in time, and it goes to various locations. I have to do Glasgow, Italy, day, night, exterior, interior. So I suppose the first thing I became really aware of was the need for flexibility and fluidity. Uh, and had the play only happened in this one building, we might have been able to do it out of a, a large number of fixed lights, each of which just does one job, covers one part of the stage in one color but that would have taken an enormous number of lights. And so actually I've ended up using uh, a, a lot of moving lights, which I requested very early on, so that we could keep the number of lights to a fairly sm small number and drive them very hard so they do lots of different jobs. Mm. And in fact, on stage behind the proscenium, almost everything is either a mover or an LED which can change color in order to produce all those different looks. Yep, that makes sense. And unfortunately, in most of our schools, we're not quite there with all the LEDs yet, although we get to see them on stage, which is pretty awesome. Are you using any traditional lamps at all? Oh, yes. Um, there are a few fixed ones. Um, just at the sides of the stage here, there are some basic covers which are on a lot of the time, and so they just do either a fixed warm or a fixed cool. And the, um, virtually everything out front, apart from a, a small handful of movers, are conventional fixed position lights. So yes, it is a mixture, and when the show goes out on tour, the LEDs on the movers will travel with the show, so it's absolutely consistent. We have the same lights in the same places everywhere, but then what comes in from the front of the theatre will be whatever each theatre has available. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. So if we could go back to Ken for a second, could we ask Ken, is there any um, characters that you, when working in the rehearsal room, thought, yeah, I, I've got a clear vision on how I want this characterisation to be, and an actor decided, that's not how I see them? <laughs> that does occasionally happen. Um, but because of my, my approach tends to be quite collaborative, I may come in with a certain idea of how a, a character might come off the page. Um, but as a director, I need to be open enough that the actor is also, you know, has a creative input into that. Um, and some, most of the time, we find we're on the same path. Occasionally, you, you don't, and you have to kind of work through why that view is different and, and come to a solution which kind of uses both views. But with this, this play, um, I was really, really lucky to have such a, a brilliant cast. Um, they, they're, they've all been so hardworking and committed to the play. Um, we've, we've, we've also been talking about, in rehearsals, a lot about our own backgrounds um, and the different influences that make us all behave in the way some of the characters do in the play. So, for example, two of the actors do have Scots Italian heritage, uh, Chiara Sparks, that plays Lucia, and Carmen Pieraccini, who plays um, Rosanella. Um, but also, um, we Huey here, uh, Craig, and uh, uh, Danny, who plays his sister, um, both have back in, in, the, in the background Irish heritage as well. So um, that was really useful and it was actually, actually accidental. Um, so we haven't had any, I don't think any uh, kind of conflict over what the characters should be. And also because Anne-Marie writes them so clearly, we, we feel our job really is to, to find what's on the page and bring it to life in a, in a truthful way to the script. That's our, that's our job. Um, we could obviously o overlay lots of other opinions, but it wouldn't necessarily be the play that Anne-Marie has written. And, and as a director, I really like to respect what the writer is trying to do as, as the starting point for the production. Perfect, thank you. So let's talk about Huey then, if that's okay. Passing that mic down. Um, so have you had the audience reactions that you thought you might have for Huey? It's been great fun. Um, yeah, there's, and there's things that I'm still finding out. Um, the more shows we've got under our belt, um, we're still finding new things, new laughs, and new bits where people, you know, might feel a sense of emotion, might be sad, happy. It's it's a it's a real roller coaster of a play. It makes you feel loads of different things, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a special play. Is there a moment that you really enjoyed? I like the sunburn scene. That's, <laughs> <laughs> I, like, uh, I think we all do, uh, right? We all enjoy the sunburn scene. And I, I, I really enjoy playing Huey at five years old. It's, it's great fun. It's, um, it was great fun in rehearsals to, to kind of channel into that and, and just get to be a wee boy again, which I probably still am. I still need to grow up a wee bit, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can you uh, describe probably three moments in his personality or three words that we use to describe Huey? Okay, yeah, um, he's lovable, uh, can be cheeky at times, and he's also very innocent, especially when he gets to his older years, he's still very naive as well, it's four for you there. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, can we just talk a little bit about the costume, if that's okay? Back yeah. um, so, costume, any challenges presented themselves for costume? Loads. <laughs> Le so... The play, as was said, spans 19 years and the script is written very filmically. So we have one scene running into the other, we have people exiting and immediately entering back on. So in terms of quick changes, was just, we knew it was going to happen, but it did happen. Lots and lots of quick changes, lots of passages of time that we wanted to try and show, we didn't manage to show Ideally, we would have had a new costume for every scene, every next day, one week later, two months later, because the script is really specific about that. There's one point that says 10 days later. It's like, how am I supposed to show that? Someone needs to come on with a card going 10 days later. <laughs> so the costumes, we tried to make the costumes tell that story for us. So that was the challenges with that. And just out of nosiness, because people have asked already, did you make the baby version of Lucia's dress before the actual version, or the other way around? Big version first. We presumed we would use the big version as in that scene, and then it came through as a rehearsal note that we wanted a little version. So we very quickly made a second version <laughs> after the fact. 
Thank you very much. Lovely. So in terms of tying all of this together then, you've had not many audiences so far because we've just started Thursday there, but we've already had different reactions. Would that be fair to say, Helen, from things you've yeah. hearing and seeing? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, have there been any surprising reactions, moments that you thought, oh, I didn't see them going to react like that? Well, there's the big one where um, Massimo slaps Lucia. And I don't know, I didn't, I didn't get here in time to hear your reaction to that today. I don't know, was there a reaction to that? But, because in the other audiences, there have been a variety of <gasps> gasps, and some have laughed, but very small laughs. But So I don't know what you made of that, but I think that reaction took the actors by surprise, didn't it, to begin with? They were, they were very shocked that the audience were so open about their... And, and I think that is because nowadays any kind of physical violence, but especially towards children, is such a big... Mm -hmm. you no, know, we just wouldn't do that these days. So it's a shock for an audience. So that was definitely a reaction that we weren't perhaps expecting to be so vocal. Um, any others? We ended up redirecting it, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, that, that particular moment, because on, on the very first preview, uh, Massimo, <laughs> just in the heat of the moment, took quite a wide swipe. So it looked as though he nearly knocked her head off. Yeah. So the audience went, <gasps> like this. Um, so after that, we redirected it, so it was more of an impulsive mm. clip, and it didn't get quite such a, a, an ugly reaction. <laughs> and indeed, it, when Rosanella then slapped Massimo, it got a laugh, uh, because he got his comeuppance for doing that. Yeah. But there were the, I, I came in at the, the sort of tail end of the play today, so I saw the second half of the second half. So I was able to hear and see your reactions to that bit of the play. And I was saying to the team earlier that um, there's bits that you as an audience found funny that our other audiences haven't laughed at at all. Um, like Luigi's character, Lucia's father, whenever he was shouting, I'm going to take the mic away, Lucia! And he's really loud. Um, you all seem to find that really funny that he was, a, a, you know, quite a vocal dad shouting at his child. Um, but the other audiences haven't found that quite so funny. And there was lots of things that maybe our um, our other audiences have found funny that you that you that you weren't um, reacting to in the same way. But then Sam has pointed out that you've probably under strict instructions to be quiet as well. <laughs> so And behave beautifully, which you all have you, done. Of course you, you, have. you did, you were, <laughs> everybody was. It was like a pen, you would hear a pin drop when I walked in, I crept in at the back and I thought, oh, they're so focused, they're so into this, which was great. Wonderful, thanks. Could I ask um, about the language? Has there been any research uh, even from the acting point of view or directing point of view of the phrases or words that we're thinking, oh, so what does that actually mean? We had to do some research in the background. To yeah, it's to usually one of the first things I do when I'm working on a script, apart from reading it to get to know the story. If there's anything I don't know or understand, the first thing I do is look it up, um, either in a book or uh, asking the playwright directly or, or looking online. So obviously there are things in, in a lot of historical things in this which you have to check, uh, but also um, I'm not an Italian speaker, uh, so we had to do. I had to learn what all the Italian in the play meant. Um, and in fact, we had a vocal coach working on the show uh, because, uh, as you will have seen, Rosanella works in this kind of hybrid Scottish-Italian accent. Her husband Massimo doesn't have a hint of a, uh, an Italian accent because he's been in Scotland since he was a wee boy. But Rosanella has come as a young married woman, so she's been an Italian woman who has learned to speak. Uh, English in Scotland um, and it's a really particular sound which you don't hear so much around in Scotland anymore but you used to hear a lot when I was growing up um, of, of that kind of hybrid uh, and you, you hear it in other, in other uh, communities that have come to Scotland where they get a mix of their own accent and, and a Scottish accent so we, we were absolutely keen that we had to get that right and um, 
Obviously, Anne-Marie has some input into that and does speak Italian herself, uh, but she has this wonderful auntie called Auntie Anna, who is 90 now, who speaks in that hybrid Scottish-Italian sound. So Rosanella uh, Carmen, who plays Rosanella, went and had a session with her just to hear her speak. Uh, and she, her nonna, uh, her granny, uh, used to speak like that, but she couldn't remember enough of the detail of it. So she did a lot of work in advance of rehearsals as well as through rehearsals to familiarize herself with it and find out what those sounds were. And, and Caroline, who did the vocal coaching, she also does the vocal coaching for... Outlander, um, and she uh, she's great because she's got a really good ear for accents. Uh, but she also kind of looked at the bits of Italian that were used, um, how a character's vocal choices might be influenced. You'll notice that um, uh, Franco, for example, doesn't speak Italian really. He has a couple of bits of Italian, but you'll have you'll have odd sounds like he'll, instead of saying Italian or he'll say Italian. So just we uh, kind of differences like that, we had to pinpoint and get really accurate. Fantastic, thank you. So I'm going to open up to the floor for a second if there's anybody would like to ask any specific question. And it could be further to what we've learned today or something completely different. If anyone is brave enough, or fabulous enough, yes, amazing. How old are Lucia and Hugo throughout the show? So um, I start... Uh, we both start at five years old and then when we do the scene where we do the, the ginger drinking and we, we take a sip each, we, I just turn nine, so we're about nine years old and then in 1955 when we do the, uh, the jiving, I think we're just shy of about 19 years old, so about 18, 19 years old. That's a great question, thank you. And that must have been a real challenge as well for an actor, because usually you're given a character and you are that character in that moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know, I, I found it, in rehearsals anyway, I found it more easy to channel into the five-year-old than what it was to channel into <laughs> a grown-up. Uh, that was when I found the real difficulty. But um, no, it was really good fun. It was, it was really good in terms of like testing myself and, and seeing what I can do and trying to find the little quirks and... Um, mannerisms that a child would use and then an older child because he, when he's nine years old he's a little bit more sure of himself and then when we skip to um, when he's about 18, 19 he's less sure of himself again so it's, it's, it was good it was a real kind of up and down it was good great thank you thanks for that question anybody else got another question okay sorry if this is a bad question but what would you say the hardest part of the play was sorry. the hardest part of the play okay so the hardest part, so we'll take it in terms of your job then. How about we yeah. do that? So hardest part to direct. I think the hardest thing with this play, because it, it's written a wee bit like a film or TV script. Um, so the hardest part for me is to make sure that we're getting the detail of each individual scene right. But I also have to look at the arc of the whole story. So you can do one scene brilliantly, but then if you hang around to go into the next scene, um, then you're not necessarily doing your job right. The rhythm of scene to scene is as important as the rhythm of each individual scene. So we wanted to make it really fluid, so it floated really quickly from scene to scene, kept a pace going. Um, so sometimes that would inform how Hilary and I chose to use music. Sometimes um, you, you may have noticed subconsciously, or not subconsciously, but you may have noticed in Hilary's music when it was a time passage and when it was just a punctuation. Um, there's a lot of interesting detail in that. So getting that rhythm right, we were continually working on, and, and it's also with lighting, when it's, when it's a fast fade, when it's a quick fade, when it just chops from one scene to another, or when we take time to move from scene to scene. All of those decisions tell the audience something. Um, so it was, it was a really challenging thing to do, but, um, but an enjoyable challenge as well. Okay. Any further challenges anyone would like to say about I'll their role? Yeah, uh, the biggest challenge for myself and Adam to begin with was to work out how to create the crowd and Ken, of course, how to create the mob attack on the shop. And Ken and I decided very early on, I was going to underscore it, but actually drive it so it's more soundtracky, I suppose. But then when we're in rehearsals, we tried all sorts of things. We just, because the actors were fantastic about um, just improvising mad mobs approaching. <laughs> and uh, you're quite contained in the rehearsal rooms. It feels very present that they're just like 
just outside the door, but you come into an auditorium, it's a completely different thing. So we pre-recorded the actors and some volunteers from the staff in the theatre to record the Giovanezza, male voices that you can hear in one little clip, and then the party scene stuff as well. <laughs> when the gay gardens are going on. And, but uh, we also recorded the, the crowd approaching. And then to try and get that balance of pre-recorded crowd noises approaching the shop over a long period with the pre-recorded soundtrack and then in the wings, we also added in what's called Foley, which is like live sound effects as well. Uh, stage management hitting things and the actors who are off stage at that point, uh, actually making you feel as though they're right outside the shop. So though, when you've got like four incredibly different elements all coming together and over quite a long queue, uh, we needed to work incredibly hard to try and make that balance happen and always when you're a musician or a composer, you want the music loudest, but you've also got to hear any dialogue. So when the family are cowering at the table and they've got odd little bits of dialogue, you've still got to, you've got to feel their fear or it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's my hardest challenge. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, probably also trying to, uh, well, two, two issues, trying to create the mob. Uh, we, we, but first of all, when I saw the, the model of the set and I saw the shop window at the back, I assumed we would actually see some of the cast silhouetted against the background. But Ken was more interested in a, a slightly more abstract approach with the sense of the mob being off stage somewhere and just big shadows. So uh, I ended up putting a couple of lights on the floor, throwing big shadows across the stage, uh, which I, I believe some people thought were projected, but in fact, it's, it's live action. It's, it's the people who are not on stage in the scene making sounds and running up and down just out, outside the door there. So that was one issue. And uh, uh, did it work? I mean, uh, did, did, you, did you get a sense of a, a crowd out through the door? Yeah, we've got lots Good. of nodding. That looks uh, and the other issue really was, without really physically changing very much in, on the stage in terms of the set, having to create two very different feels for Scotland and then going to Italy. So... <laughs> the, my favourite lighting... Well, it's not my favourite lighting, but one moment I love in the play, I don't know if anyone noticed, but in Scotland, the roof tiles are all grey. Uh, but when we go to Italy, it's red pan tiles, and that's down to Wayne. That's me, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. I mean, um, there are some changes in the set. that We go from white painted window frames in, in Scotland to these turquoise uh, shutters when we go to Italy. But I also was very careful to use sort of neutral, less vibrant colours when we're in Scotland and actually not to light the, the surfaces of the set at all when we're on interiors and then to save the much more vibrant colours for when we go to Italy. So all through Scotland, the, the, the sky cloth at the back is sort of tones of grey or, or uh, a subdued green and then suddenly when we go to Italy, the sky lights up as turquoise and of course it's a different cloth because you suddenly get to see the trees for the first time when we're in Italy. There are actually two separate cloths, both there all the time, and the trees are there all the time. Uh, the, the cloth at the front is a gauze, which is a fine net with lots of small holes, so that when you light the front of it, you, see, you don't see through it at all. It's dark behind, so you just see the clouds. And then when I take the light off that and put the light on the cloth behind, the trees are revealed. Uh, and as Ken said, that <laughs> very early on when we were looking at the model of the set, we noticed that the, the roofs of, the, of these buildings were just grey slate. And Ken in passing said, oh, wouldn't it be nice when we go to Italy if, if they could look like uh, sort of terracotta pan tiles? And I thought, okay, well, I'll have a go. <laughs> and I happened to mention this after that very meeting to Martha, who is the, the scenic painter here, who did a brilliant job on them. I didn't realise she'd obviously taken this on board. And she came up with a fantastic mixture of a base colour of grey. Then she put some sort of metallic sheen into the paint, so it's slightly reflective, because it, if you've seen new slate, it has this slight luster to it. And then she put shellac over the top. I don't know exactly what she did, but whatever it, it was, it responds brilliantly to the light. So when we were plotting the lighting, and I mixed this colour, I actually went, wow, God, it works. Uh, so, and, and, and Ken was then quite excited about it as well. So the other thing in Italy, I don't know if you noticed, maybe it's a subtle detail that people didn't pick up on. All the scenes in Italy are exteriors, but we're in two different locations. That's Luigi's house, 
and that's Massimo's father's house. So just to, to pull the eye to the right location, I swap around where the sun is coming from. So when we're in Massimo's father's house, the sun is all coming in from this side, and then when we go to Luigi's house, the sun or the moon are coming from this side, just to point your eye in the right direction. It's a small detail, but maybe it helps to, to set location. It certainly does. I can't believe they've even got better tiles than us. So we've got rubbish weather and rubbish tiles. That's what we just learned, didn't we? Us, us fellow Scots. Um, brilliant. Anything uh, about set or costume you want to talk about that you've not already said? I think you've discussed there was a challenges. Challenge. Yeah. Well, we did manage to get Frank went on World War II army uniform in 29 seconds. Yeah. So that was a challenge, but we managed it. Yeah. That might be a world record. Let's well, check that out. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Any final questions from the floor? A um, couple of things. Um, I really, really liked the shutters. I thought that was great. Thank um, you. I noticed that Huey had um, bruising and like cuts on his leg. And I wondered, did the actor apply that himself or where was the, the, the concept for that when you were a wee boy? The cuts and bruises, the majority of them are all real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, dedication um, for you. <laughs> I think I came from rehearsals. I, I tend to throw myself about quite a bit. And um, I've, I've built up a, a few wee cuts and bruises down there. I've dirtied them up a wee bit. We've got some brown paint to make it look as if he's been kind of rolling around in the mud. Um, but no, the majority of them are actually my real cuts and bruises. <laughs> <laughs> There's some questions down here at the front, if that's OK. Yeah. How did you prepare for your role? So I was very fortunate in that when I was your age that I studied Tally's Blood as well. And as did my younger brother, a lot of the kind of kids in my community that went to both the schools, because both our schools were quite close to each other. Um, we all done Tally's Blood, so it was really good to kind of come full circle and, and, and work with, with everyone here and get to play Huey because it was someone who I'd, I'd played as, as a kid. Um, in preparation for Huey, I'm very fortunate that I've got um, I work for, when I'm not acting, I work for um, a great couple, uh, two guys, Eddie and Colin, and they've got an adopted son called Robert, and he's five years old. So when I got the job, I sat Robert down and I says, you know, how would you, know, how would you say this? How would you, how would you move like this? And, and, we, and we played around with it and we, and we worked at it together. So I've, you know, I've kind of stolen the majority of his ideas. <laughs> I didn't say that, but you know, Robert was a great help in in, in preparing in preparing for um, for playing Huey and Kiara. When we started rehearsals, she put me on to. Has anyone ever seen um, the Secret Life of Five Year Olds? It's hilarious. So yeah, we watched a lot of that and we took a lot of that sort of stuff in, and um, and then as a nine year old, I tried to channel into what I was like when I was that age, and it was very. Um, yeah, very sure of myself at th at that age, and very like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna do this because you know it's it's cool. Do you know what I mean? I'm gonna I'm gonna be Blood Brothers with Kiara's character, and and then and when I when we skipped to um, to 1955, the preparation for that was I'd watched a lot of kind of a lot of films that were of that era. So like Rebel Without a Cause. I mean, if you look at the, the uh, Stand By Me, which is a great film, I took a lot of references from that. Fraser was great help in terms of the, the costume and the design that really helped. Once I got into the costume, that helped even more. Um, and yeah, um, and jiving, I had to learn how to jive, which was fun. Um, Kiara was very patient with me. She's a fantastic dancer. So yeah, it was, uh, it was, Lots of good hard work, but yeah. On the Saturday night, uh, you remember the, uh, the scene where they're doing the Gay Gordons? Um, we wanted a bit of um, Scottish country dancing in it and kind of Scottish songs and Scottish tunes as well as Italian to kind of, because they're so much a, a part of the culture in both countries. Um, but in that scene where they're at the wedding, uh, on Saturday night, Craig came on dancing on his own and continued to twirl and barrel and, and shout. And I thought, oh dear, something's gone wrong. Uh, and Danny's has a very, very quick change before that scene. Yeah, 15 seconds. She got uh, 
off to do the change. They got the dress on, they zipped it up and the zip broke, leaving the back of the dress gaping open. So she was very quickly being pinned back into the dress by the, the dresser that works on the show. And um, he, he did a brilliant job improvising and, and keeping the, the country dance going. And, and Danny eventually got on and she said, oh, I'm sorry, I got stuck in the toilet. <laughs> um, so... The, there's a, a lot of fun in, in, in live theatre as well. Some things you're not always expecting. And the, we were a bit cursed with that as well, aren't we? Because on the Friday night, the chair got caught on our dress as well, which uh, was that added a lot of fun to, to that particular scene as well. I'm going to pass back to Helen because she hasn't answered about challenges. Oh, I don't know what... As an assistant director, the challenge is to keep the director happy. <laughs> So I hope I managed to do that. Um, challenges as an actor are very, very different, but um, I was very fortunate I didn't have any on this play. <laughs> I'm in, indeed. So going forward with the show, I'm going on tour with the show, so all of the different venues we go to, there, may, there will be great challenges. You're right, Ken, in that... Um, a lot of the stages are completely different to this, um, different size of auditorium. This stage at Perth is on what is called a rake. I don't know if you'll be familiar with that term. The, so the stage slopes. Um, a lot of the venues that we're going to don't have that. We'll be playing on a flat floor. And then there's one venue that we're going to that is much smaller than any of the others. And so that is going to throw up challenges to all of our departments. Um, so when we're on tour, I need to um, make sure that uh, the, the show retains its integrity and re-block anything that needs to be, that we've had to change given whatever situation we're in. So that's my challenge, Chris. Brilliant. Thank you. Any final question? I think we've probably got time for another one over here. Um, how much preparation did you need to put in before the like rehearsals even started? Because I know there was only like a month or two of actual rehearsals. So how much work needed to be put in beforehand? Yeah, the rehearsal period, we have three weeks in the rehearsal room, then a week on stage before we bring an audience in. But I probably started work on this a year and a half ago. Um, just trying to get the money together for the production. We've been really fortunate and we applied to an organisation called Creative Scotland who... Uh, fund a lot of theatre that you see in Scotland and they turned us down um, because they didn't think anybody would be interested in Tally's blood. Uh, fortunately, Perth Theatre and the Gaiety Theatre in Air still wanted to do it, so they got together and they brought Cumbernauld Theatre into the mix as well and between them they've all funded the tour. So that's, you know, having the idea to do the show is the first thing. The second thing is finding the ways and means to do it in a theatre who wants to take it on. Um, and then, then you start assembling the production. So normally it, it can be anything up to 18 months, two years that you're working on a show before you actually get it in front of an audience. Great question. There was a, another question up at the back, I think. Yeah. Um, so when you found out you'll be working on this specific play, what were your initial thoughts and reactions to it? Initial thoughts and reactions to doing the play for the first time. Um, I'm going to hand that over to Craig. Thank you. Um, Sorry, before I let him speak, <laughs> I'm not normally that dictatorial. Um, I have to say this guy, we did auditions for the play and uh, this guy, uh, I'll let you tell the other bit of the story, but um, this guy came in and there was no question, by the time he left the room, the part was his. He just came in completely prepared and totally convinced as that was the only Huey Devlin we could cast. I turned up to the wrong theatres for my audition. <laughs> so I got up in the morning, went to Glasgow, passed the UK theatre school, by the way, got on the train at Queen Street and came to Perth. And the two ladies at the reception, yeah. The two ladies at the reception said, can I help you? I says, yeah, I'm here for the audition. No, there's, there's no addition here today, son. No, no, no. I says, no, it's, there's a mistake. I says, I'm, I'm here to see Ken. And the other lady sat down and quick as a flash went, Ken's not here, son. Ken's in Glasgow. So I had to run outside. I had to run back to the train station, get on the train, wait an hour. Meanwhile, I've got tears in my eyes. And I'm wallowing in it for about an hour on the train. <laughs> And then I get off the train and sprint to the UK theatre school. And um, just at that time, Anne-Marie was coming down the stairs and she went, Craig? And I went, yeah. 
Yeah, how are you doing? <laughs> but um, I think it showed how keen I was to come and work with you, wasn't it? <laughs> um, I was so excited. Um, when I'd seen the casting call for it, I was straight on the phone to my agent. I said, I said you need to get me seen for this. I, I studied it. I, I would absolutely love to do it, to work with Ken, everyone here. I, I would, it would have been a total blessing. And I felt like I could resonate with you. We were not... With the well, the place set in Ham it begins in Hamilton, and I I'm from a place called Hollytown, which is maybe about ten minute drive. So I, I, I was really, really pushing for it. It was a dream role, and yeah, I was just I, when I found out that I got the call, I was just so, so lucky. There's, I, I, I mean, apart from working opposite Kiara and Danny, who are amazing, like absolutely amazing, and Carmen, uh, Paul, and Andy are, are massive role models of mine. So the chance to work with them as a young actor was just it was amazing. Yeah. Lovely. So we're just going to bring it to a close and you've actually answered this question already with your favourite moment, which is a sunburn. Can we just pass up the mic and talk about everyone's favourite moment? It doesn't have to be something that you've done, but it's just your favourite moment of the play. I mean, we love the play equally, mm -hmm. but I don't know, probably the window scene. Yeah, the window scene. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with the sunburn scene. That's my favourite. <laughs> I love that conversation about your Ken Sani. <laughs> oh, yes. Wee Sani and Big Sani. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's great. Yeah. I have so many moments in the play that I love because it's such a beautifully written script. But I have to say probably my favourite moment is um, Rosanella up in the window um, and Massimo comes back and they rediscover their love for each other but particularly her reaction when she jumps back 20 odd years and, and goes my daddy's locked me up <laughs> it's just such a lovely moment and, and ends the play with a real kind of upward hopeful moment I think my favourite moment is Massimo's internment speech um, Again, that was one of those moments where Ken and I had looked at it and <clears throat> I set about writing some music throughout the whole speech, which is about four and a half minutes long. It doesn't sound very much, but when you're writing music, that's quite a long cue. And uh, and then Ken and the, and the actor Andy tried it in rehearsals and it just Ken's words to me the next day were, the music was doing the same thing that the actor was doing, so can we just use the beginning of it and the end of it? And it was the right call because he's such a great actor. I just wanted to hear the story. I didn't want to hear my music. But when it comes in at the end, it's pretty good. Yeah. So that's fine. <laughs> that's great. There's so many great moments, but I'm, one of my favorites is a, a tiny, tiny little moment. And it's in the second act of the play. And it's when Rosanella has finally realized what she's been doing and how she has stood in the way of true love and when she says, I'm going to cry just talking about it, it makes me that emotional when she says to Huey, Huey's son, I'm sorry, because she never apologises for anything up until that moment and she's treated him so awfully. Look at me, that's ridiculous. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank that's you. Enough. Can we just make sure that we give them the warm applause that they deserve for a wonderful production? Thank you.